Special guest for you this morning, as we have been having special guests uh, quite a lot in the lead up to Australia Day, because later this month, the Australia Day Council will name the 2017 Australian of the Year. One of those running is South Australian finalist Kate Swaffer. And Kate was diagnosed with dementia in 2008, shortly before her 50th birthday. Since then, she's been a leading advocate for better services and outcomes for the 354,000 Australians currently living with the condition. She's also completed three degrees and is now doing her PhD. Kate, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Morning. What led to your diagnosis? Take us back to 2008. I think pre-2008, I'd had brain surgery in 2004 or 5 and I was seeing a neurologist for regular checkups and had started having some episodic memory loss and some other cognitive changes so and I call wired dyslexia um, and I thought it was just a side effect of the brain surgery so I didn't most younger people particularly who get diagnosed with dementia often find it takes two or three years to get past their GP to get a referral because you diagnose, you, you're often misdiagnosed with other things. Um, so for me, I didn't have that kind of long process to get to see the neurologist because I was already under one. So it must um, have been a huge shock when he just said, this is what it is. Well, it was. And, and I guess um, in fairness to all neurologists, none of them can prove 100% you've got dementia until you have a brain aut autopsy. Most of us are not quite ready for that. Um, but I think that the big change in the face of people with dementia is that, like 40 years ago when I was nursing, and ironically worked in Adelaide's first dedicated dementia unit, our patients were diagnosed late stage in the disease, whereas many of us are being diagnosed much, much earlier in the disease process. So the, the face of people with dementia is changing because Obviously, our deficits are nowhere as severe as I'm told they will be down the track. Um, what, and what you've achieved since your diagnosis and what you continue to achieve in your advocacy, was that, um, was that fueled in some way by the work you'd done previously? You just mentioned well, that you had done that work a long time ago. Partly fueled because I was at university, so the general message that almost everyone with dementia even today is still given is to get their end of life affairs in order to get acquainted with aged care uh, and to live for the time you've got left and that's okay because dementia is a terminal illness but to be told that in a very early stage of a disease seemed to me inappropriate not not initially but down the track and the university you know I kind of was lucky that I was at university they just simply saw me as Kate Swaffer, a mature age student wanting to do degrees for fun, not, wasn't doing it for career change. Mm. So they sent me off to their disability services support team. And um, after getting a letter from a neurologist for that, um, they set me up with strategies just like they would have if my son went to university with dyslexia, for example. And so I, that really changed the way that I see the symptoms of dementia and like things have changed but if I lost my legs in a road accident or if I had a stroke I would have very quickly been put into rehabilitation and I see that now as a major human rights issue because people are being diagnosed earlier and earlier and earlier and we have exactly the same right to rehab and speech pathology and all of those things that initially I self-prescribed. Um, so what does, I mean, obviously what you're saying is that, that living with dementia is, is the important thing. It's not dying from it, it's I, actually I think, learning to live with it. I think that's my key role or message is to empower other people already diagnosed with dementia to go home and think they can live with it. But what does that mean in practice? What are the practical challenges for someone, even an early diagnosis? Well, the practical challenges are overcoming the stigma, and the, the, the research clearly talks about how stigmatised we still are with dementia um, and the discrimination, so being told to give up work, and in fact, I should have been just given another job within the same company. Um, 
but from a practical level, I think that people with dementia of any age should immediately be given a disability support plan. The same as my son would if he had dyslexia or any other disability. And, and your message is not just for those people who, um, who have been diagnosed, but for those people around them, the family, uh, employers yeah. and everyone they come in contact with to treat differently people with dementia. Absolutely, mm. and uh, there's been a massive global push for dementia-friendly communities. Um, if people cross the road rather than talk to us, then it's not an easy place to live in our community. We have wheelchair ramps, we have hearing loops. Um, Speech Pathology Australia and Scope uh, last year put out uh, a communication access symbol, and I would like to see businesses all around the world take on that process and have a, a communication symbol so that so that if people with more advanced dementia have trouble communicating, can still go to their bank and know that the staff there will support them. What, what would that do for the, um, the emotional health of people who are suffering? Well, I think that people with dementia, when they are given what I've termed prescribed disengagement, so we're told to disengage from our pre-diagnosis life and to get ready to die, well, that takes away my hope, it took away my husband's hope, it took away my kids' hope, it took away all sense of any hope for a future. And yet there are people like me all around the world who are actually learning to live with dementia, not just to go home and die from with it. With an increasingly early diagnosis, that's yeah. the key though, isn't it? The Absolutely. Once upon a time, no one really was labelled as someone having dementia until they were in their 80s and, you know... The misperception that we're late stage and doing inappropriate things and can't communicate is so entrenched, even in people with dementia. Some, I, I, I am a co-founder of Dementia Alliance International and we run support groups for people with dementia all around the world now. And sometimes we'll have a new member join the support group and even we think to ourselves, gosh, that person doesn't look like they've got dementia. Well, what are, we, what are we supposed to look like? To be fair to the community, though, I guess many people have not been um, exposed to younger people with dementia, and many people would say exactly what you just said. They'll be watching this now and they'll be saying, gosh, she looks just fine. Absolutely. And if you had cancer or blood pressure, would anybody question that? Mm. I doubt it. So you just need to be treated the same. So we just need to be treated with the same respect. You know, if I was a doctor diagnosing patients with dementia, I'd be highly offended that people were accusing my patients of not having dementia. Kate, you mentioned hope before. What is the very latest in medical science that gives you hope that we might find a cure for dementia? Well, I, I think predominantly the message uh, or, or the, the conversation of people with dementia now, I mean, there's probably 50 million people in the world with dementia currently diagnosed, but that would be a massive underestimate because even in America, less than 50% of people have a diagnosis. In India, for example, only 10% of people get a diagnosis. So the actual data is probably um, m way under where it should be. But in Australia, we have 1,800 new cases a week of dementia. I really advocate for better care, for less stigma, for not non-discrimination, for human rights approach to the way that we're managed. Um, and for me, the most hopeful research that's come out in the last two or three years is from a, an, an academic neurologist, um, Professor Dale Bredesen, whose first very small pilot project of 10 people with early Alzheimer's or MCI, which was pre-dementia. Um, six of those people on a, really a holistic program of diet change, of mm. lifestyle changes, of, uh, I've forgotten the other aspect to the program. Six of those people went back to work. His next study of over 100 people, um, which is still a small cohort, 90% success rate in slowing or reversing mm. cognitive decline. So that, that, that academic is going on to do a major study at the Cleveland Clinic 
Now, to me, that's the most exciting research in the and world. And that's progress. And the risk reduction evidence is very clear. So lifestyle changes, if you smoke, give up smoking, similar for heart disease or diabetes, you know, mm. look after our health. And obviously, if you if you win Australian of the Year, that's an, you've already South Australian of the Year, but that's an added platform uh, for making people more aware. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing Thank your story, you. and we wish you all the very best for Thank you for having me. Enjoy that wonderful ceremony on Australian Day too. Thank yeah. you. Mm.